Okay, so in diagnosing gluten sensitivity, it's very important to understand where we're coming from. Blood tests are nonspecific and most commonly are negative for the reasons that we just talked about. Biopsy is only specific for celiac disease and it's not an accurate representation of our intestine. Stool tests are accurate, but they're limited to gliadin, so they only are really looking at one of the glutens and they're not looking at all the glutens, so it's a limited test. Do you guys know what predictive antibody testing is? There was a really, really neat study done where they took blood that was 30 years old. They had frozen this blood. They took it from people in the Air Force 30 years ago. It was stored. They pulled it out of storage. They looked at the blood. They measured it for antibody production. They measured it for autoimmune antibodies. In other words, antibodies that our own body makes against our own tissues. And they found a very high percentage of the blood samples that had autoimmune antibodies present they found that those people actually, 30 years later, ended up developing the autoimmune disease. So developing the auto, this is why we say predictive antibody testing, because some of you probably got, got positive serology, positive tests for any gliadin or any tissue transglutaminase, but had a normal biopsy. And so maybe the doctor said, don't worry, you're, you don't have celiac disease, continue to eat gluten. Well, this is where predictive antibody testing comes in because if you make antibodies to gluten today and you may not have the damage that's present yet or identifiable at this point in time, but 20 years from now, after 20 years of eating it and 20 years of damage, now you develop the disease. So autoimmune disease can take 20 to 30 to years to develop. And it's very hard to put in remission once it's there. It takes about two to three years to put in remission on average. So you don't want to get to that point so predictive is something that's going to be talked about more in the future. They're doing some really neat stuff with this now. To date, the best way to look at it is genetics. Because genetics show you what your genes are going to do when exposed to gluten. If you have these genes, and, and a lot of you are maybe aware of the HLA-DQ genes. How many of you are not aware of HLA-DQ genes? Okay, so I'm going to give a quick explanation of what these genes do. Okay, this is a diagram of gut cells. This little, you see this term right here, HLA-DQ? Can everybody see that okay? This down here, where's my cursor? This is an immune cell, and on the surface of your immune cells, actually I think I have a better picture that's not quite so confusing because that's pretty technical stuff. Here it is. Okay, here's a very simplified diagram of a cell. This is a white blood cell. In the center, the DNA. On chromosome 6, you have a set of genes called HLA-DQ genes. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. These two genes are responsible for creating an antenna that sits on top of your immune cells. This antenna has a job. Its job is to identify things that don't belong, right? Remember the old Sesame Street, which one is not like the other? Okay. Which things don't belong in the body? This receptor, again, is coded for by these genes. So these genes make that antenna. That antenna recognizes foreign from friendly. If you have genes that are linked to gluten sensitivity, then when gluten comes in, that receptor says, bad guy, not good guy, not food, enemy. And it tells your immune system to mount a response. Does that make sense? And that's why genes are the best way to detect. Because you can be a newborn, not sick yet, but if we can identify genetically whether or not gluten is going to create disease in you 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, we can stop that from ever happening. You don't ever have to miss cupcakes. You don't ever have to miss birthday cakes. You don't ever have to miss pizza because you never had it. Right? So we don't have to raise this child on a horrendous diet. And that's all horrendous stuff anyway. But we don't have to raise this child on a traditional American, standard American diet and then change everything and have them go through all the social stress and trauma of having to change their diet and be special, right? 
because that's one of the things about going gluten free is you have this there's this whole social stigma about it. Does that make sense? I'm not boring you guys with too much scientific stuff. Okay. So when we talk about how to diagnose gluten sensitivity, your best way, your most accurate way is DNA. Now there's two gene associations, two gene allele associations with gluten sensitivity that most people are aware of, HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. Okay, these are celiac associated genes, but there's a whole other subset of DQ genes that are linked to gluten sensitivity of a non-celiac variety. So if we go back to that term we talked about earlier, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, if your doctor does an HLA-DQ test, most labs, as a matter of fact, there's only two labs in the country I know don't report it this way, but every other lab in the country reports it as either you have genes for celiac disease or you don't have genes for celiac disease, but they don't look at the non-celiac gluten sensitive genes. So if you don't have HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8, but you have one of the other genes associated with gluten sensitivity, you'll never know if you do it through a standard lab because they don't report those alleles back. They just say negative. The doctor never even gets the report. The lab that I use, I, had, I forced them to send me the report. I wanted to know what the genes are because I do all the interpretation. So I just say that because if you go to your doctor and you say, I need to have a DNA test done for gluten sensitivity, and you get it done and it comes back as negative for DQ2 or DQ8, it doesn't mean you don't have gluten sensitivity. It means you don't have DQ2 or DQ8. You still have to know whether or not you have DQ1 or DQ3 because those are the other two associated with gluten sensitivity. And it's very important to know that because I don't want you to go out, have a negative test, say, well, my genes were negative. Dr. Osborne said this, that, and the other. Well, I can go eat gluten. And then you go eat gluten and you wonder why you end up with autoimmune disease 10 years later and you think that guy was an idiot, right? So know that there's DQ1 and DQ3 that are also linked to gluten sensitivity. Okay. Here it is. These are all gluten positive genes. Now that looks awful confusing. Okay. We're talking about serological values and, and numerical values for DNA. Um, if you want to talk to me later about this, I'll be more than happy to go into depth. I'm not going to go into much depth here. This was just a research study done in 2000. Yes, question. Go to a doctor and it's not you, do you need to have them specify which lab to send it to so that they get the full report? Or you know, I, it depends on the lab and it depends on the relationship that the doctor has with the lab. Like, uh, uh, the two of the main labs that are out there, Quest and LabCorp, you can get HLA-DQ testing, but you're not going to get these values back. I don't care who you talk to, it's run like the government. Somebody's in charge and they don't care. There's no customer service. Does that make sense? Prometheus is another very popular lab that people will go to online to get DNA testing done. And they have this stratification diagram that they've calculated your actual risk for developing celiac disease. And it's worthless. Because, again, it only looks at DQ2 and DQ8. So why did I even mention them? Stay away. No. I don't want to say that. Okay, this, is, um, this was published here recently by the American Journal of Gastroenterology. How many of you have heard of IBS? Irritable bowel syndrome, right? You go to your GI doctor, you don't know what the heck is wrong. He says, oh, you just have IBS. Take Zelnorm. By the way, that one was pulled off the market a few years ago because of a lot of bad things. But Anyway, where did that come from? IBS, irritable bowel. Let's think about more, I like to think about common sense, right? We talked about grain and common sense earlier. Let's talk about the gut and common sense. What is the gut? What is it? It's a tube, right? It goes from your mouth to your anus. What does that mean? What is the thing that affects the gut the most? Food. You put it in every day, three times a day, sometimes more. Sometimes too much, sometimes the wrong kind. Why wouldn't we look there first? Why would we look at all this other BS? Why would we do that? Why would we look at all these other strange tests that don't really tell us anything? Yes, you are inflamed. The test said you are. 
I feel inflamed. The test says, I, the test says I'm not. It, it doesn't make sense to do all these expensive tests that don't really tell us what's wrong. They just tell us that something is either present or not present. And if something is not present, we usually get a big stamp across our forehead that says you have too much stress. Here's Prozac. Here's an antidepressant. It's ridiculous. I don't know what's wrong with you, so here's a depression pill. Um, so common sense dictates that the most common thing that affects the gut is what? Food. So why don't we look at food first? And one man's food is another man's poison. Just like one man's trash is another man's treasure. I once had a young boy who was allergic to blueberries. And we all think blueberries are healthy, right? This young boy missed three days of school every week over gut problems because he was allergic to blueberries and until we figured that out uh, he was miserable. So anyway, we have to look at food first. So back to IBS. Irritable bowel syndrome, which is just this vague diagnosis that a lot of people get, is oftentimes caused as a result of being gluten sensitive. As a matter of fact, I was very happy. I've been doing this for about 10 years. I've been using DNA testing and, and treating IBS for that long. And Mayo Clinic last year finally came out and said, hey, if you got somebody with IBS, you should probably do DNA testing to measure whether or not they have gluten sensitive genes. And if they do, you should take them on a gluten free diet. So Mayo finally officially came out and recognized that's a great step. I mean, I implore them for taking that because, you know, usually it takes a lot longer for mainstream to get on track. But that's what this study was. It was if a person has, a, if a person has IBS, they need to be tested genetically for gluten since 